my wife and I, we love going on trips. We like adventure. And so this early morning when we uh, woke up, I asked my wife, Ani, uh, what's your most uh, memorable trip? You know, in all the past years, we've been traveling. And she thought for a moment and said, um, Costa Rica? Because we went to Costa Rica. And I said, whoa, yeah, Costa Rica. I remember the time when, for the first time, we decided to go on white water rafting. <laughs> you know, my first time. And they ask you, you know, do you like uh, advanced? Medium, easy. I want to say advanced, but I have to say easy. Anyway, so we decided to go there, and uh, and then uh, we were just a few of us in white water rafting. You know, this you you ride on a raft, and and the guy said, uh, "Who of you is are the bravest?" Because you have to sit in the front. Of course, you're the bravest. Who else? So I was sitting in the front. <laughs> Anyway, so we were there and I was enjoying uh, with the white water rafting and, and my wife was sitting at the back. And then suddenly I heard this shout as we were going through this rough part of the river or the stream or brook, whatever you call it. And uh, they said, your wife fell! <laughs> I looked at the back and she was missing. She was gone. And of course, what do you expect from a brave husband, right? <laughs> I stood up there, you know, jumped into the water, rescued her from the deep, you know. That's my side of the story. Uh, her side of the story will be, come on, Burmese, so only a knee deep. And it was the other guy who rescued me. <laughs> but anyway, you know, going through journeys in life is always fun. The point that I wanted to share with you is that today, uh, we are on a lifelong journey with our Lord Jesus Christ. At the point in our lives when Jesus said, come with me, that was the beginning of the journey. And until now, all of us here are still going through this journey. How long it will be, I don't know, but it's pretty obvious all of us here are not done in that journey that we are in. And in this journey, God will never give up on us. He will never abandon us. He will, he will never leave us. He will always be with us in this journey. In fact, Jesus, our God, will be with us in this journey for, for eternity, for a long time. He is faithful. And He is faithful to us as well. So our final destination and Jesus calls that perfection. And uh, it is not in this life or in this age, but it is somewhere in the future. And we can just imagine that. But even in our journey as a Christian, if I can go to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, um, here it tells us that the journey continues even in our education, in our study. Hebrews 6, Verse 1. And it says in verse 1, here's what Jesus says. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about baptisms the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. So what he's saying is, let us go on, move on. Talking about the gospel is important. Talking about the gospel, all the basic doctrines are key to our growth. But the Bible is also very, very clear here. It tells us that our journey with Jesus it's not only about talking about the gospel. It's not just, you know, proclaiming the gospel, but it's about having a relationship with Jesus and walking the gospel. It's a gospel talk and a gospel walk. It is a journey. Sometimes some Christians or evangelicals can 
commit the mistake of just being limited to focusing on preaching the gospel, the talking. But they don't realize that in our journey with Jesus, it doesn't end with just talking about the gospel. It doesn't end only with understanding what faith is or the resurrection, but it continues on. That's what it says in this journey. And that's what we hope for, to continue. And hope is a key to continue on moving forward. And the reason why it is important is because people today live in, in despair. It's a lot of anxiety today. A lot of people have fear, uh, resentment, anger, frustration, and they don't see the solution to these problems. They don't see how the gospel of Jesus Christ is the solution. The message that we proclaim. Maybe they read about it, they read about Jesus, but they don't see that as a solution. So it's just talk. It's all in, in the hand. So therefore they move on without the real hope and they don't really or cannot appreciate what the gospel is and should be what we've been called for uh, and we are welcome and what does it mean to be redeemed by Jesus to be forgiven and to be loved they don't know that God has provided the solution and the solution has a name Jesus and this Jesus invites you and I for a journey. It's a trip. And it is a gospel walk. It is a, a walk of delight, a joy. And uh, that's what the people of the world do not know and they don't understand that we have Jesus. And so that's where the lesson we'd like, I'd like to discuss today because we live in this hope of our Lord Jesus and um, it's not just a gospel where we talk about it, but it is a gospel where we walk and we live. So, in this gospel, is not just talk, but it is a, an, an upward relationship with, with God. And it is in a form of worship. And just in case, just for your... Uh, uh, curiosity. This message, by the way, is the message that we will give at summer camp. The same theme, journey with Jesus, and this is actually based from Gary Dedos' uh, manual or curriculum that, that he made. So basically, uh, this is how we how we start. He said this walk is a walk of one of relationship. It is, and this relationship we can call maybe. If we choose a word, it's called worship. This is our upward relationship. It's worship with God. It's a walk of worshiping God. And number two, it's a walk of uh, relating to people. He calls that witnessing. So we continue in our journey with Jesus Christ, not just the talking of the gospel, but it is actually living the gospel by continuing on our relationship with God, worshiping, and then also a relationship with people relating with them. So the messages that we've talked in the past, you know, all in the past, following Jesus, being his disciples, loving God with all of who we are, you know, with all our strength. And in our daily worship, in our this example is this weekly gathering is a form of worship. But the point that we would like to stress is that. The gospel is lived. Sometimes people might say, we are not talking much about the gospel in the church. Yes, actually, the gospel permeates, you know, everything in our lives. Even when the sermon is about merits, there is the gospel there. If the sermon is about leadership, it's about faith, any other topic, the gospel, because Jesus Christ is in the center of the gospel. So he is there. So our our walk with God includes one, worship, and then that worship leads to witnessing. Uh, the word witness, Gary Dendo mentioned, is actually uh, witnessing for Jesus. 
That's our role. And uh, a witness, he said, is someone who tells others what he or she has seen or heard. That's a witness. So in this journey, you know, we, we're done with all the basics, right? We are now moving in relationship with the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the witnessing. And basically, witnessing is sharing what we have experienced, what we have seen. Like in a courtroom meeting, a witness tells the court or the judge or the jury or the lawyers and the public what they have seen and what they know and what they have seen. They are sharing first-hand experience. That, that's a witness with, with those who are there, you know, giving a witness. And that's in our journey. We give witness to people about Jesus Christ and the way of life we have. So a witness needed to present the facts. That's what a witness does. For those who did not see, they have to present what happened, the events, for those who didn't hear. That's what a witness does. Witnesses tell about what others don't and couldn't know at that particular time. So that's, that's what a witness is. And what is even better in a courtroom is where we have multiple witnesses all sharing the same story. Our journey becomes more effective as far as our journey as witnesses when we all together as witnesses speak the same story. We experience the same Jesus. So when we share our stories of our conversion, for example, when we share those things, that's gospel. You know, when we have testimonials with Mary speaking here, that's the gospel because it's about Jesus. When we share how God healed us, and uh, that's also part of the gospel. You know, when we hear different topics, when, when we witness by, by our example, that's preaching the gospel. When we go on missions, when we go at SCP, when we get involved in different aspects of church work, that's part of the gospel. And again, as I said, you know, it's too bad that in the past years, sometimes, you know, people can get limited with the gospel being just talking about it. But there's, there's more to it. And this is exactly what we do when we witness about Jesus. We are passing on to others what they don't know or what they don't understand about God. They don't know about God's love, so we tell them. And they don't know about this invitation for a relationship, so we tell them. And often we can start by sharing our personal stories. That's why it's, it's good to know, you know, Christ in us. Uh, we talk about preaching the gospel. I think the first thing that we need to do is to preach the gospel to ourselves, you know, to, that we understand what that is. So witnessing enables those of us who are in worship, relationship with God, to serve and love those around us. That's what witnessing is. A witness is a representative. The Bible calls that ambassador. A witness is a representative of what it means to walk in Christ. Now, a witness is not perfect. You know, one does not have to. Men and women who are mere humans with frailties, just because they are imperfect, does not disqualify them from being witnesses. Otherwise, no one of, none of us can be qualified witnesses if that is a requirement. So a witness introduces others to Jesus so others can, can also share the joy that we have. This delight, you know, it's a miracle, you know, we, in all our imperfections, somehow God gave us a reason to be happy. And we get, we get excited because of that. Um, before I continue with a message, and instead of reading the Bible, I'd like to show a video, if Stephen will just, this video is actually the Bible, um, and it's about the, the story of the Samaritan woman that Jesus Christ met. And that is my scripture, and I'll continue after that. He 
In Samaria, he came to a town named Sychar, which was not far from the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by the trip, sat down by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw some water. Give me a drink of water. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. So how can you ask me for a drink? Jews will not use the same cups and bowls that Samaritans use. If you only knew what God gives. And who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would ask him. He would give you a life-giving water. Sir, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get that life-giving water? Well, our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well. He and his children and his flocks all drank from it. You don't claim to be greater than Jacob, do you? Those who drink this water will get thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring, which will provide them with life-giving and give them eternal life. Sir, give me that water. Then I will never be thirsty again. And I will have to come here to draw water. Go and call your husband and come back. I don't have a husband. You're right when you say you don't have a husband. You've been married to five men and the man you live with now is not really your husband. You've told me the truth. My Samaritan ancestors worshipped God on this mountain. But you two say that Jerusalem is the place where we should worship God. Believe me, woman. The time will come when people will not worship the Father either on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans do not really know whom you worship. But we Jews know whom we worship because it is from the Jews that salvation comes. power of God's spirit, people will worship the Father as he really is, offering him the true worship that he wants. God is spirit, and only by the power of his spirit can people worship him as he really is. I know that the Messiah will come, and when he comes, he will tell us everything. I am here. I'm talking with you. At that moment, Jesus' disciples returned, and they were greatly surprised to find him talking with a woman. But none of them said to her, What do you want? Or asked him, Why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the town. Done. The so they left the town and went to Jesus. In the meantime, the disciples were begging Jesus, Teacher, have something to eat. But he answered, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. So the disciples started asking among themselves, Could somebody have brought him food? My food is to obey the will of the one who sent me, and to finish the work he gave me to do. You have a saying. Four more months and then the harvest. But I tell you, take a good look at the fields. The crops are now ripe and ready to be harvested. The one who reaps the harvest is being paid and gathers the crops for eternal life. So the one who plants and the one who reaps will be glad together. For the saying is true. Someone plants, someone else reaps. I have sent you to reap the harvest in the fields where you did not work. Others work there. And you profit from their work. Many of the Samaritans in that town believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they begged him to stay with them. And Jesus
Jesus stayed back two days. Many more believed because of his message, and they told the woman, we believe now, not because of what you said, but because we ourselves have heard him, and we know that he really is the savior of the world. story and here we see uh, the journey that God gave this Samaritan woman um, in the story you, you can first uh, notice when Jesus Christ introduced himself to the woman uh, he took the initiative Jesus did and it was surprising uh, because uh, Jewish persons uh, were not supposed to approach or interact with any Samaritans especially a woman. Yeah, that's a no-no. Especially during a bright part of the day, midday. And, uh, but Jesus Christ took it upon himself and uh, that opened the door to building a relationship. So he took the initiative through a conversation. And if you also notice in the conversation, uh, it moves gently step by step. He was letting her know bit by bit who he was since uh, the woman had no idea. You know, who is this uh, Jesus? Uh, so he didn't really like pull, pull up a truck and downloaded the whole thing, you know, to the gospel. No, he did not. He noticed he was sitting down and he, he was engaged uh, with her, engaging, and uh, he did a lot of listening in fact, uh, one method Jesus Christ did, and it can be, it's very effective, is he asked for help. He put himself in a position where he said, I need a drink, could you please? So he put himself in there, and somehow that is effective in opening also, you know, like, whoa, this woman was affected by that, and the Jew kind of trusting me, and and willing to put his lips on this gentile cup that I have, right? So he's asking for water leads to a, a revelation that she has some kind of uh, spiritual hunger. And of course he didn't realize that. And she responds to, to Jesus, you know, with questions, and he follows that up by answering her questions. That's kind of slowly how he does that. Uh, sometimes when we walk through this journey and meet people, uh, it can be tempting for us to just totally unload everything, you know? Give them a, a lot of deep, heavy theology uh, because probably we're so excited or maybe we want them to know that we know a lot, but uh, it, it doesn't help. And in, in that case, in, in, with Christ, he came to a humble position of, I need some water, you know, requesting that. So here we see Jesus responding by also affirming her honesty when the discussion is about having more than one husband. He was honest, I mean, you know, he responded to her honesty and uh, of course uh, revealed to her that uh, he knows more of the story. And so she experienced a number of uh, um, her life is, it was a difficult life because the Jews looked down at Samaritans and of course these are like half breed, you know, Gentile mixture with Jews and the same thing with their religion is kind of, cannot be trusted, you know, so they were looked down by them. And then not only that, he had this relationship with other men and so that's, that's probably worse and she experienced this failed marriages and perhaps uh, many of those people in Samaria have given up on her because they look down on her on her character and you know you know that's the society that's how it is but it is an amazing thing that that our Lord Jesus didn't care about that that this woman who had all these frailties uh, was the woman that Jesus Christ approached and 
made her into a powerful evangelist that led to the conversion of many in the city of Samaria. And, uh, you know, that kind of surprise her. It's clear that, uh, you know, that interaction with, with Jesus uh, got her really, really excited. Uh, she became a simple witness, you know, in that aspect of her life. And what did she do? Well, she testified about Jesus. I mean, she didn't go to school. You know, she had a bad background. She's a woman and a Gentile. Even the disciples didn't want to deal with her. And yet, she was a witness. And she tells those people what she heard. A witness. As I, we were just defining what is a witness. She told them what she saw and what she heard. And uh, basically, she even just asked the question, can this be the Christ? The same question that she asked, are you the Messiah? Can this be the Christ? So she simply directs them to Jesus. And some apparently began right then to, to think about that. And they became more curious. Um, it's an amazing thing. And they said, now we believe, not because you told us, but because we, we experienced and felt. I mean, isn't that the same thing with us? When we first came to our enlightenment, because some preacher, somebody taught us, and we say, yeah, now I understand because I heard this sermon. I understand, but now through the many years, Jesus has lived his life in you. You can say the same. Now, I believe, not because pastor this said so, but because Jesus lives in me. I have felt. He has answered my prayers. He has dealt with me. I mean, the same. And that makes a, a good witness. Uh, she doesn't expect all of them to believe also. You know, dealing with the Samaritans, uh, she just wanted to tell them. She didn't have to be offended. She, she may have a bad reputation among them. She, you know, in today's standard, you might say, she's not the best uh, witness as far as we, her character goes, not the best witness as far as her character goes. But that did not stop her. That did not stop her. She didn't get into an argument with them and say, hey, you ought to believe me. This. She did not. She just was a simple witness. She was not offended if they didn't believe or if they ran away or whatever. She knows that in giving a witness, it is not about her. It is simply being a witness, not to herself, but to Jesus. That's what a witness is. So what does she do? She points away from herself to him. That's the witness. Directly to the one person, Jesus. And so what happens? Many decided to go and see. And she introduced them, and they got to meet Jesus, and they experienced him on their own. That's why in verse 41 it said, John 4, So when the Samaritans of the village came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days, and many more believed because of his work. People began to have a personal experience, relationship with Jesus. Not just because they heard the gospel, but because now they have a personal experience with Jesus and said, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we heard for ourselves. And we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. And uh, I know you can say the same. I can say the same. Uh, I heard the gospel preached, you know. But the time came when I was so angry, I was upset because I was coming from a legalistic background and I didn't know what to do. I was crying and I, you know, and, and God impressed in my mind to go and study, go and read Hebrews and Romans, read that. And I was praying and suddenly the light came on and I began to understand, you know, kind of a personal. And then I began to talk to him and then he began to respond in those so this Samaritan woman uh, of poor reputation got to be a very effective 
witness and God I feel in this journey that we have with him as we have already been established and I assume all of us know and understand the basic doctrine Christian tell us we know that God wants us to walk continue with our walk with Jesus God used this woman to direct others to the Savior of the world <coughs> again she did not convert them she just was a witness and she was so joyful she had this delight you know in the video you see this excitement that is what happens <coughs> that's what happens to to people when they experience the Lord God gives them this holy delight not because delight opened you know but it's this joy that we we can have this it's a miracle thing and it cannot be explained this this delight that God gives us in our journey and that's something that uh, people experience you and I we experience even, even in the scriptures this this delight can be uh, the shepherds in Bethlehem who were dancing outside of the cave when they heard of Jesus is Mary this delight that God gave her uh, looking at this baby on the feeding trough this delight that probably Joseph had when he had to teach this creator of the universe how to use a hammer this, this delight uh, that we heard with Mary Ann with with the grandfather praying for for a baby on the sixth hospital the baby lived that, that kind of delight it's it's a delight that is satisfying and in this journey God gives that delight when we are aware of that it's a, it's a delight probably of Andrew being able to see that this little boy's lunch box the contents fed thousands of people that kind of delight this this uh, a leper who was healed and he was looking at his finger and one that is missing and and seeing one new finger coming out of the hand can you imagine that delight and